Good afternoon. Um, this is the simulation or the innovative event that um, we were asked, uh, invited to try and produce. But we decided that was way too complicated a title, so we simplified it a little bit, uh, down to something a little more straightforward, enhancing anesthetic man management for IOM. And what we're trying is something that, quite frankly, we've never tried, and we're not sure anyone else has ever tried. So um, I'm Leslie Jamison, and this is? Colby Simmons. And the two of us um, there was a, are going to try and do a real-time simulation up here. Now, originally, this innovative experience was not quite so innovative, and that's because we were going to have 90 minutes, we were going to have two stations and a lecture, and we were going to have people from Cadwell come and help us. We are now 60 minutes. There are two of us. The Cadwell person, uh, unfortunately, is in the hospital, so she is not here to help us. And so Colby is two people. Just so you know, he managed to learn how to use this program overnight, literally, to do this. And so um, it's changed a lot. Hopefully it will be helpful. But we really want uh, people, when they fill out the forms that say whether this was worthwhile coming to, to make serious suggestions of what we need to do different, better, what was successes, what we should, and suggestions about how to help it, because we would like to be able to use this to teach residents and others what IOM is really all about. And so you are part of the program, and you are the guinea pigs, and thank you for spending a late afternoon on Sunday with us. Um, so this, this is going to be what we're going to do. Um, and the, we're going to do the objectives because that's required by the CME. So I've underlined the objectives so I do not have to actually read these things to you. We're going to talk about the physiology that makes IOM both interesting, easy, and difficult. Um, and it's related to patient age, their gender, and all their medical comorbidities. It's something that people rarely talk about. We're going to look at the, our clinical role without us doing our job as an anesthesiologist well, we're not going to have anything to monitor. So you're the critical piece in all of this, in that role. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the common drugs, and it's the same slide you've seen since probably before you were born, but there are a few new ones out there that we're going to uh, talk about. Um, and we're going to talk about interventions that we think work. Um, Let's say that when we use them, they work. That's why we're using them. But I can't give you a randomized controlled trial that proves they will work. The most important thing you should walk away from this to talk knowing is that IOM is a diagnostic test. Um, and that means that it's like potassium or a CAT scan or an MRI or a hemoglobin. It gives you information to use. It is not any kind of an answer. It is information. And in order to get good information, you have to help us out by giving good anesthesia management. So the information <coughs> is a signal interpretation that the anesthesiologist, you folks, and the surgeons have to make to use that information to make it useful to change your practice and change the events of the patient. <coughs> Um, it, and that we can't emphasize enough that some people somehow think that it's magic. It's not magic. It is a test. And the person giving you information is a person who's, in, who's reading what the test says. It's like this nurse. She calls you up and says, potassium's 10. You do something. It's the same kind of thing. So we want you to leave looking and seeing a, an MRI of a spine or 
some portion of the brain or all the other places you'll find us these days and you'll be able to look at that, know kind of basically what the problem is and get a personalized <coughs> anesthetic management for that patient to make them get a better chance of going home because we'll have the test available to them to make different actions. So why is it so important to preserve neural tissue? I mean, maybe it doesn't matter, you know? I mean, it's good if you don't have a stroke, but does it really matter? This is um, a thor thoracoabdominal aortic aneurysm. Um, this is the morbidity from it. This is published by the guidelines from the European Society of Vascular Surgery. They advocate for neural monitoring now to be present in their cases. And if you look at the green line, the green line represents the people who did not have any neurologic injury. The blue and the red lines are the people who either had woke up with a neurologic injury or they had a, a delayed neurologic injury after they woke up. So they woke up fine within the 24 hours afterwards they had an injury. Both of them do something rather nasty they have a huge mortality rate. They have a mortality rate from a number of things, but there's a marker there that we're trying to measure. How do you know your patient's in trouble and you need to do something if you don't have a marker? And the neuromonitoring can be like the canary in a gold mine, and a, and a coal mine, not a gold mine, sorry about that, a coal mine which tells us we have to do something. So these are the, this is the data from, from the European society. So there's a lot of really bad stuff that is neuro-bad stuff that's associated with it as well as things like renal failure, which you all already know is if that happens to a patient during an anesthetic or surgery, is a probability of, of death or of terrible disability is real. This is the vascular surgeons in Europe. So we have this test, and we've got to figure out how to make this test be something we can see. So there's things that are immutable. There are conditions in IOM that we have to adjust for these things. They're never going to go away. One is time, how long you've been on this earth, um, your sex, that changes things, what your if you're aging, if you have comorbid conditions. All of those things change our signals and the ability of us to get a test. What has, the biggest thing that's happened is, in the last 20 years, we've gone from something in 1999 where this was a spine, we did testing for spines. The kid, they were young, young adults, they were women, Generally, they had no comorbid conditions. It was idiopathic scoliosis. It can be as much as 5% of the population. Um, the quality of the equipment was rudimentary. And even though you can't see me because I'm behind this podium, um, the, the equipment was literally taller than I am. Um, the, quality of the, 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 um, the quality of the signals was wonderful. They were big, they were robust, they looked great. It's because the patient was robust and looked great too. That's not how it works. So what we're going to do now is Colby is going to simulate how we get monitoring um, in a spine. These are gonna be SEPs and MEPs. And what he's gonna do is he's gonna show you what it looks like to get it and how nice they are. So this is the screen that is actually seen by uh, an IOM technologist inside the operating room. And I'm going to just kind of walk through what we typically look at. So at the University of Colorado, we are fortunate the anesthesiologists uh, manage and supervise all interoperative neuromonitoring that takes place. And so we have uh, the ability to work directly with the techs in the operating room as, and directly with the anesthesia provider providing the in-room anesthetic care. And so we have uh, a very good relationship with our surgeons um, as well as our techs because we're in there and, and constantly communicating with, with the team. And so we frequently go and look at the screen that our technologists um, have available and we make recommendations based on what we see. And so this is the screen that we have. Um, 
I'll try to use just the mouse cursor here, but so we, um, on most uh, cervical spine cases, we do both upper and lower SSCP or somatosensory evoke potentials, and we do um, motor evoke potentials as well. So for our upper extremity SSCPs, we stimulate the median nerve at the wrist, and we measure at the uh, cortex. So we're stimulating with um, between 20 and 40 um, milliamps of, of stimulus, and then we record uh, with a microvolt response over the uh, somatosensory cortex. Um, we, we record again at the cervical response, which is seen here at C5 FPZ. Um, that's where the potential difference is created as the um, signal crosses at the medial lemniscus. And then we measure again at the somatosensory cortex at the contralateral side at CP4 FZ. <clears throat> And then for the lower extremity, we use the tibial nerve and we stimulate at the medial malleolus. And again, we uh, record at the cervical response, at the medial lemniscus, and again at the somatosensory cortex. So I will just turn this on and show you. It's the, the signal is generated over a period of 200 seconds. It's uh, this, the, the machine takes an average of the best signal. We have a... Um, it, it eliminates noise and artifact uh, from uh, electrical stimulus, either from a bear hugger or a cautery or um, fluid warmer, whatever. We set a, 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 a boundary for it to reject any signal that's above or below that, and then it, it averages that signal and amplifies it through an amplifier to get us the response that's seen here. Um, we set a baseline, which is the uh, green um, color here at the bottom. Let me move that down this signal here. Uh, we set a baseline after a couple, uh, a few runs, First, uh, the first few runs we just make sure that the signal is going to be re reproducible and monitorable and then we, from there we measure uh, all, all responses based on that which, um, so every patient is, there, is the baseline or is the control. So we don't have a standard um, uh, signal response that, is, that we use for each patient. Each patient, we, so we do have a, a signal that we consider monitorable or non-monitorable, -monitor, and we use that for all patients, but each patient can have a, an amplitude of signal that is greater or less than the other. But if it is less than a 0.5 microvolt response, then we typically say that's not monitorable. Okay, so this is what we see typically with our um, our sensory responses, and then I'll just show you here. This is I'll blow this up. This is uh, what's called free run EMG. So we typically select motor uh, muscle groups that have nerve roots that are affected directly by the surgical uh, procedure itself. And this one we set up for vastus medialis, tibialis anterior gastroc, and adductor halysis um, just for this simulation. But it is a continuous and uh, continuous electrical response that we measure throughout. And if a surgeon happens to uh, work, be working too close to the ventral nerve root and creates a motor response that's measured, then, then we let the surgeon know during that, that specific time. But we're not going to talk much about EMG, um, so I'm just going to... So those big, tall things, that's the stimulus we're giving. And the other kind of small, little wiggly line between them is actually the EMG. Right. So these, this, this, uh, yeah, the large here is from the electrical stimulus that's being generated from the uh, somatosensory evoke potential that we're creating. So if you've seen a spine case and see the patient m doing their hands like this because of the stimulus that's being created, that's what's measuring here on the EMG. The small in between here, that would be what is the baseline um, non-stimulated muscular response. But I'm gonna, I'm just gonna get rid of that, and that way we can have a bigger screen here. So the other um, modality that we use for our spine cases is uh, motor evoked potential. So I'm going to change the screen to our motor evoked potential, and show you how we do this. This is um, the stimulus is uh, given over the um, somatomotor cortex and measures the corticospinal tract and is uh, measured um, at the muscular groups associated with uh, the surgical procedure that we, are, that we have particular interest in. So for cervical cases, we do adductor pollicis brevis. Well, I guess this isn't a cervical, but um, we always do an upper extremity muscle group as a control, and then this would be for a lower extremity case, and then vastus medialis, tibialis anterior, gastroc, and adductor halysis. 
And so we usually begin our stimulation at around 200 volts. And then before we stimulate, it's always asked if a bite block is in place, just as a, a protective mechanism, because the patient will, will elicit a, a, a strong motor response and can uh, create uh, damage to the tongue. So we, we check that, and then we stimulate. And then each muscle group, the, the, the response is a polyphasic uh, response that uh, we hopefully see at each muscle group. And then the technologist will make adjustments to the size of the response just by clicking and changing muscle groups. But we, we did generate, in this case, a good response. Stimulate again, and we're, again, good. So this is, uh, this is the basics of what we do with each spine case. The other thing to remember is that um, these things change just from simple things like gender. So gender can be a woman t um, will actually conduct these, these transmit along their nerves faster than gentlemen were will. So that's part of the reason we, everybody is their own control. So they will have a shorter latency. And guys, because of muscle mass, will tend to have taller and bigger signals. So everybody is unique when we do these things. There's not a standard test. <clears throat> so the other thing that we're going to do is we're going to look at age, because age is a really big problem. Um, and um, as we age, this actually is the frailty scale that is used here in Canada. They're the people who started this. And we start out very fit, but somewhere along the line we end up with walkers and walkers with helpers and then in bed. And those things are a reflection of the changing neurologic functions that we have and the ability to move and have our muscles generate activities. So we're going to demonstrate now the effect of age alone. So these are healthy people, but they are older people. We're going to do a middle-aged person and we're going to do an elderly person. The bottom line that we'll show is going to be the youth and then you'll see the other things coming up. Just one second. I'm generating the simulator. Okay. Here we go. So we set our baseline with our healthy young adult, and you can see that the baseline is in green um, on each respective modality that we've chosen. That's the baseline. And then it is somewhat, I'll blow one up here, but you can see that on an older, um, frailer adult, we have a decrease, well, first of all, I think the most obvious the first X here that you can see, that is, what, that is our latency baseline. That is the initiation of the response. When you look at the, and this is the young, healthy patient in green. When you look at the elderly, frail patient, and this is the response that just came through, and you superimpose those, you can see that the latency has been increased already by between 20, uh, between 15 and 25 percent, and that the, the amplitude, which is the, the height between our first initial latency marker and our trough uh, marker has been decreased again by between 30 to 40 percent. So it's, it is striking the difference that happens when a patient is just older, uh, even without other comorbid conditions, that the typical patient has a, 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 a striking uh, decrease in amplitude and an increase in latency. And while uh, Colby switches over to doing the motor evoke potentials, which are the more sensitive of the two events, you'll see the same kind of, of, uh, of, of activity. There will be a change in the conduction, and there will be a change in the amount of energy that's being produced. So again, our green is the baseline, and we'll stimulate. We'll, I'll, I'll first stimulate the patient at the same parameters that we had before, which is 240 volts um, with a pulse width of 50 and a pulse count of 5. This is, uh, those, those are technical terms that can change the ability to generate better responses, but we'll stimulate it first and at the same and see what happens. And we get zero. 
So this patient had no response for the same uh, level of intensity of stimulus as a young healthy adult. So we can increase the stimulus, I'll just increase it to 440 without changing any of the other parameters and see that we begin to get a hand response and this is something that you will see. Um, muscle groups that have larger numbers of nerve endings, hands, feet, that we um, use more often, which is somewhat contradictory. A lot of people think that the larger muscle groups will more often have a uh, larger uh, amplitude response, which is not exactly what happens. The smaller muscle groups with larger numbers of nerve endings actually generate larger uh, uh, amplitude signal than the larger muscle groups, which is somewhat contrary to what I, I initially thought. So I will change the stimulus again to uh, increase the pulse count and increase the pulse width. So what he's demonstrating is we have to optimize ourselves in order to get a good test. But if, you, if we get thrown a curveball and you use medications or do activities that don't support good neural he neuron health, we, it becomes impossible to be able to do the test. This uh, simulation is being difficult for me to uh, generate a response, actually, um, which can happen in real life as well. So uh, often... You're getting the message. <laughs> <laughs> and this is, this is why, again, the, the anesthesia is so vitally important because um, the, what choices we make for our anesthetic... Um, for anesthetic impacts greatly what responses you get. So even knowing that the patient's older and will, will have more difficult time generating responses makes it even more important for us to select anesthetics that are uh, appropriate for this. So let's, um, what, we, what we need to take from what we've tried to just do um, is that whether it's motors or sensory, the latency is longer, takes, the signal takes longer to get there, and motor in red is much more affected than sensory, and you could easily see it in sensory. We actually eliminated it in motor with, in an 80-year-old gentleman. The amplitude is smaller. It's 50% of what it was. And the velocity is much, is about 22%. And the critical piece usually is motor because it's the most sensitive to everything. And the data that you see here it comes from a recent paper that came out of Nigeria. Um, and this data from Nigeria was taken in completely healthy individuals. Um, there isn't much that's available in the literature, but this tells you the trend. Everything gets slower and smaller. Now, we are only doing MEPS and SEPS, and if we had our 90 minutes and a lot of other sexy things, we could do more. But we need to understand this is the nature of the neurologic condition um, in people. So this, is, this, this line here is the youth, and you'll see that looking at ABRs or BEARs, whatever you call them, brainstem auditory vogue potentials, you're hearing. It's... Lots of bumps, it's big and tall, nice and sharp, short latency, and this is a 65 to 70 year old person. If you look at that, less smaller, less bumps, and the arthritis that affects your knees is also affecting his, his or her ossicles, and the effect and the transmission of the nerve is, is dramatically different. We look at the EEG, people look at EEG all the time. You can just see from looking at that, there's far more activity and intensity in a young adult than there is in a 70 year old. And so whatever we are that we're doing, we're gonna see a lower amplitude, longer conduction time. And, we, and so we need to have the best conditions we can to be able to do the test. Now, I don't know about you, but when I go to the operating room, none of my patients are 85 plus and don't even have hypertension. I mean, it just doesn't happen. So my at least 30% um, in Colorado, which is the, I think, still the thinnest state in the country, uh, have um, a glucose problem. So they have a metabolic disease. We don't know what cardiovascular disease does to these, these, this test. We do that the metabolic effect of, of diabetes is quite 
significant. And we know that it's probably somewhat significant for renal, but the bottom line is going to be, the bottom line here is going to be they all go down. So we've already got a signal we can barely recover, and now we're going to drop that baby another 30%. So it's Colby's turn to try and push this through. And we do apologize for the small delays. Like I say, he's a clone of two people. <sighs> Sorry, I'm pushing the wrong button up here. Yeah. There we go. So it's, uh, again, um, it looks similar to an older individual. But basically what we see, I'll start the simulator again, is an increase in latency and a decrease in amplitude. Well, let's look at a lower extremity. And it, and it typically is worse. Lower extremities are typically worse uh, or more difficult to get an adequate signal response. But again, you see the latency is the first uh, marker and the amplitude is the, the uh, difference between or, or yeah, the difference between the two. And so we see an increase in latency and we see a, a decrease in amplitude when, when superimposed. So that was the most recent response. It's not a, a great difference in amplitude, but, but it is certainly a, a difference. Um, one other thing to note is that when we are doing IOM, we look at both the cervical, which is this uh, lower response here, and the cortical response. And we say that if either of the two are still present throughout the case, then there's not a significant change in the um, in the signal. And most commonly, the, the, the cortical response is more, uh, or the cervical response is more resistant to anesthetic changes. And so we often use this, the cervical response as our, as our formidable baseline, and we follow it throughout the case because it's much more resistant to anesthetic, it's much more resistant to um, temperature and other, uh, other related Are factors. Are you oh, yeah, I can show you a, a motor voc potential as well very quickly. Um, just to give, let's fire it up here. And again, hmm, we're having trouble generating much of a response. This patient just is. This patient's way too, again. way too way, real life here. He's too much like the real thing. So, <laughs> so, so what we're, what, what we're going to do is again. The thing we want to take home is diabetes reduces your, makes you have longer latency, bigger amplitude, and, and a slower velocity. And when you add those two together, you've got a signal that was this tall that's now this tall. And so small changes make it like our motors. So what do we want to do? What do we know about our management choices? What kind of things can we do to intervene? Um, and so we're going to talk about that, but we want to take a brief detour. Now, we've talked inferentially about criteria. Everybody for every test has a standard. I can't give you the standard in the, in the world I can tell you our standard, and what the, what the standard is, is that we will use the term not reliable for monitoring. And that means that it's so small that just the changes in the temperature of the room and the long term, the effects of long term anesthesia will make them be something I can't tell if they're actually changing or not. And these are the standards we have 300 microvolts, 0.3 to 0.4 on the SEPs. And when it's a funny squiggly line, like you're seeing for the motor evoked potentials, guess what? It's not there. And we say that it's not present. We can't make any decision. We can't give you an answer to the question of what does the test say. It says it's not there. It doesn't mean the patient doesn't move. It doesn't mean the patient doesn't feel. But it means when we stimulate a little spot on somebody's ankle, it doesn't get all the way up to this little spot in somebody's brain. And that's what we're asking the signal to do. Nor does it mean that the spot that's up here in the brain that we're telling we want the big toe to wiggle, that it gets there. So something is not right and is changing about the signal and its dispersion, especially if it's a change during the case. So what about drugs? We can't do without them. 
We kind of like them. This thing goes back to, I think, about 1970 when the first person did the first SEP. Uh, and, and you know this, volatiles are bad. The ones, the ones that are good or better, I don't know that anything's good, but better, are the, the, uh, the intravenous anesthetics, propofol, ketamine, opioids, and some people use benzodiazepines. Um, I don't, so I can't say. Um, the thing that is the problem with these drugs that most of you will say you have, first of all, you have to put them in those crazy syringes and it takes too long, all that kind of stuff. But the problem is knowing how long and how much you are giving, and those two parameters are an important estimate. Um, and so we have to estimate the dose. We do it in, in Denver. Uh, our practice does it. We measure C, uh, CNS uh, processed EEG, or CNS effects. And so we titrate our drugs to the CNS effects because we have such a variation in the population. So just like we had before, where we have the population, uh, where we talk about how alert and awake they are, they change. And I showed you the EEG of an elderly person versus a young person. The result is the drugs are the same, and that's what you do for a living, so you know it perfectly. Um, if you're lucky and you live in other parts of the world, like Europe, and Asia, um, they have a target controlled infusion pump that does a pretty good job of estimating it and makes using TIVAs uh, far better, predominantly propofol. But the real questions right now are what do we do about dexmedetomidine and lidocaine? Are they good, bad, indifferent? So we're going to look at a simulation of the dexmedetomidine. This will be dexmedetomidine with propofol. Mm -hmm. So I pulled it up as she was speaking, and I delivered a stimulus, and we, we regained our, our signal at all channels. So this is uh, the patient with an early response to dexmedetomidine. So I'm going to change this to, um, we're just doing a child because the response is greater. But so we've now, this, this is simulating, though, an increased length of duration of time that the patient has been receiving the, uh, the infusion. And again, we still have a response. I'm just going to move down quickly. And you could see slight decrease in the signal. Um, it didn't take it to an absent signal, which, sorry. We'll see if we try it with, we'll try it with the adult and see if that makes a difference on our. So again, you saw the increase in amplitude, hopefully, with uh, the, the adult with a decreased amount of time that they've had the infusion running. So we'll move it along again and stimulate. And as, the as time progresses, uh, you will see that dexmedetomidine plus propofol does lead to a decrease in amplitude of the signal. And we have seen this um, in our practice. Uh, we uh, we have created a standard for our spine care, uh, for our spine protocol patients, and we have decided that dexmedetomidine is not, uh, we do not use it during, throughout the case, uh, because we have had, uh, just anecdotally, we, but we did present this at SNAC uh, this last, this past year, a uh, case series of about five patients where we had Presidex running throughout the case. We had uh, good monitorable motor evoke potentials at the beginning of the case. As the case progressed, the signals became worse and worse to the point they became absent. We turned the Presidex off uh, thinking that that may be the cause. We waited a period of time and saw that the signals returned to within baseline values and we attributed the change uh, not to any other physiology or surgical um, manipulation and we've attributed it to the Presidex and so we've decided at our institution to not use uh, Presidex within our spine cases. 
button. Let me see if we try one more really quick and yeah, so and this is what the simulation shows is that after a period of time that motor evoke potentials become almost unmonitorable. So we have signal responses at the bilateral hands and at the bilateral vastus, but then uh, as you continue distally, we, we lose uh, signal responses. And I'll show you, this is one thing that we typically like to do with our, um, during our cases is these, this is a, um, what we call it a waterfall but each one of these is the response that's been generated throughout so that you can, and it comes with a timestamp uh, for each one. So if, if we check a motor evoke potential at a certain time and then we lose it at the next, then you can go back and look at the waterfall and you can help to determine exactly where it happened and where the change was occurring. And you can, you can manipulate the, the size and the, the, the location of these, of the signals. So that's a, that's a very useful tool that we have uh, at our disposal. So uh, to demonstrate that, that we don't have a special gremlin in Denver that makes dexmedetomidine not work, um, we're going to talk about the group that has published the only randomized controlled trial on dexmedetomidine that says, no, you can't use it. This come, is old. It comes out in 2010 because everyone's kind of afraid to try and redo it. It was designed to be 100 patients. Um, they were all teenagers, so they're the great big signals, and they look like they should do very well. And this is what they found. You'll notice that um, here, um, with a minimal, minimal dose of dexmedetomidine, you, you can see these are motors, and you can see how they get smaller and smaller. There was not much effect on seps, which is exactly what we've already demonstrated. Motors are far more sensitive to things than seps are. And the important thing is, is that most of the time, the biggest decisions are made on motors simply because they are far more sensitive to neurologic injury than seps are. And then this is the maximum effect, and this came from the, the um, paper. And you'll notice in this case, they absolutely disappeared. They are so small you can't even see them. This was using a propofol background and a variety of different concentrations of dexmedetomidine. But essentially, in all categories, all categories, you find that even low concentrations of dexmedetomidine or moderate ones, they lost their signals. These are the people who lost their signals. Um, and for that reason, the, the people who uh, do the safety on a randomized controlled trial in children, shut it down. Now there are a group of people who say yes. And the group of people who say yes, let's do it, and this was published in ANA just a couple years ago now. Um, these were adults, and um, there's two things that are on here that are not what you would expect. These green lines and purple lines those are our criteria for being able to monitor. They actually show just about the same thing as the paper from Cleveland, Cle uh, Cleveland um, Children's Hospital, which is if you look at MEPs, the majority of the MEP lines are actually below what we would have considered adequate to monitor. Um, and if you look at on both, in both legs, and if you look at the SEPs, there was not much of an effect. So the SEPs, the SEPs, the dark line is dexmedetomidine added, and these are the standard ones, and eventually these are what you do when you don't add any. So um, they did a bolus technique. It was kind of a funny paper where they did a bolus technique, and then they waited. It was 60 minutes after they started, and then they gave the dex a bolus, and they ran an infusion for another 60 minutes, and then they got a data. So this was an attempt to get it steady state, but it meant that I'm not really sure how much, what the effects actually were, except to say, in our organization, we would have found this an unacceptable um, response. They would not have been considered present. So it's your turn to get involved in all this. Um, how many of you do anesthesia for neuromonitoring? Everybody? Nobody? Everybody. Most of you. You know, that was a pretty wimpy response. <laughs> 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 
the reason I'm asking is, do, do you guys use dexmedetomidine with your propofol? And if you do, do you, what, what is your experience? Do the text, the, the IOM text come over and go, what are you doing today? And they don't notice it at all. Can you tell us? We've got one person. Let's just vote real quick. So who uses dexmedetomidine with propofol? How many of those have seen an effect who or someone's said anything to you about it? Okay, so what are you doing and how does it work? I mean, how, what concentrations are you doing and who are you doing it with? 0. 0.5. 0. 0.5, okay. And? Bolus or no bolus? No bolus. Okay, so you're getting a gradual increase. I'm so mm -hmm. So you're doing it for intracranial nerves, not for and spines. And spines. How about you, sir? You, you said you did. Yeah, so I prefer to use dexmedetomidine without propofol, and I'm concerned that I'm going to have trouble monitoring the signals for whatever reason, the neurological status of the patient is such that I predict a difficult monitoring case, then I'm going to replace propofol with dexmedetomidine and maybe add other adjuncts. But I don't use dexmedetomidine in combination with propofol because it probably has, an, has a synergistic effect at suppressing MEPs. And that would be supported in, in the literature is that if you just use dex, it's fine. I think the problem is some of us are anxious about using just dex and the awareness and all the other kinds of things that go on. But it seems to be something about the combination that in some of these papers have come out and said it's a problem. Anyone else who uses both? Yes, ma'am. So one other question to ask is how often do you have texts that if they are not getting good signals come over and cause trouble? They don't like it? They, do they tell you there's a problem? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. I think part of the problem we have is that sometimes in the private practice people don't say. So we would say then use it. There's six and the rest of you don't use it or just don't do it. Don't use it. This one? The, the no group, yeah. The no group. There you go. There? Okay, so... Um, we were going to do lidocaine, but we're getting tight on time, so we're going to just blow through lidocaine, and we're going to basically say half the group say no, you shouldn't use it, because, and half the group, and there's one paper that says yes. The no group is very old, and some of them just basically measure um, the neurologic function um, of a nerve, so they give them no drugs, and they just give the infusion, and they look and see. They had changes. So to make it short and sweet, <clears throat> uh, what do we do about lidocaine? We don't do lidocaine until the end. We're finished with monitoring. That's pretty much generally the accepted practice in Denver. And the reason is pretty simple, that um, basically lidocaine functions to decrease pain by changing the neurologic, the transmission of nerves. And therefore, I'm testing the transition, the transmission of nerves. And for me, it's pretty obvious except how much. And the problem, when you look back at this paper, where it took up six hours to get rid of it, I have no idea whether this loss is due to lidocaine infusion or it's due to the real deal. So we just have chosen not to do it. How about the rest of you? Are you many of you using lidocaine? I'm going to keep moving because we will not finish on time otherwise. No lidocaine takers? Yeah, okay. <laughs> you use lidocaine the same way? 
You use anything you can find. Okay, so we would use we would use propofol. I would say standard is propofol, ketamine, um, sufentanil. sufentanil, and that's what we use for most of them. They're all adults, and they're all aged for the most part, and they're thirty or forty, thirty to fifty percent are diabetic. Okay, so we're going to talk about managing surgical events. You want to do this part? Sure, I'll just do it from here. Okay. That's took is we're we're going to start another simulation soon. So, um, so yeah. So if uh, if during the case you're confident that uh, a signal change has happened because of a surgical event, whether that be um, just compression of a, of a nerve root, so you have um, a very specific change in an EMG response and a specific change into a unilateral uh, extremity, upper or lower extremity, um, then there's certain things that uh, every every case warrants. And one of those, uh, most importantly, is to perfuse the cord in the brain and provide adequate um, perfusion pressure. So oftentimes when we have a, a surgical change that we consider a surgical change, then we inform our surgeon immediately. Um, and we typically, until the signal has improved, we drive the pressure to uh, a map of at least 85, but as oftentimes as high as 100. Um, while we're main, while we're waiting for uh, that signal to res to respond. So if it responds, whatever we get a response at, we'll usually hang at. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes we we if the signal returns and stays uh, adequately um, adequately returns for a significant period of time, then then we can we plan to extubate the patient, we take them to the PACU, and then that's fine. But if the signal uh, is variable, is in and out, then oftentimes we will, we can still extubate the patient, but we will oftentimes leave the patient on phenylephrine and take them to the ICU uh, in order to maintain a map greater than 85 for a period of 24 hours. Um, you can improve oxygen carrying capacity, which is obviously uh, vitally important. You can do that by um, transfusing if necessary. We, we, we stop the bleeding. As part of our spine protocol, any, any major spine case that's greater than two levels, uh, we, we do a tranexamic acid bolus of 1,000 milligrams and then 100 milligrams per hour for all those patients. Um, and then um, we can adjust the anesthetic. However, all of our spine cases that we do IOM for, we do TIVA uh, for all patients and they get um, ketamine, propofol, sufentanil, and then TXA if it's a greater than two uh, level lumbar uh, spinal procedure, um, thoracic or lumbar that is. Um, and then we can talk about other things that we do at the end, but yeah. there's some. We do some, some crazy stuff, <laughs> but I, I promise that I wouldn't do anything off label, right? Officially, yes. No, we never do. We don't. We, re we remove the anesthetic as part of the a variable for signal changes. We just decided that uh, there are plenty of, of papers that say a balanced anesthetic is possible. Mostly they'll have been done on healthy uh, patients and healthy individuals. However, we've decided that as part of the protocol, we remove anesthesia as part of the variable that could lead to signal degradation throughout the case. Part of the issue is we can't we can't predict what this patient's going to do, and sometimes we'll have an 80-year-old that, look like, that looks like they're 20, and sometimes we'll have an 80-year-old that we've got a barely got a signal, and it's critical for whatever they're doing that we maintain the signal. And since I don't know before I start, I, we just start with propofol, and we've gotten really good at using e, processed EEG monitoring, but most of the, pe the, young, the people are breathing, and we flip them over if it's a uh, if it's a prone position, we flip them over and they're breathing and we extubate them within five minutes. But, you know, it's something that you develop as a skill. And I would say people from Europe are probably more in that category as well because they use this context-sensitive half-life uh, pump that helps them a lot. We also do convert to a halogenated agent after monitoring has been um, has, has completed for the case. And during the closing period, we convert to a, a to volatile anesthetic. But... Um, up until that point, during time monitoring is occurring, we run the TIVA. Any other comments from anybody in the, in the group that, about whether they like that, dislike that, or would argue with us about it? It is that we do really old, sick people. Yes, ma'am. When you say extubate when they're breathing, does that mean they are falling from ants? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, we, 
Um, we generally, uh, we have, we're very blessed with having really good anesthesia equipment, so we put them on what um, the GE folks call PSV Pro, where they're the, they're the trigger to the breathing, and we pr pressure support to give them the tidal volume we want. And they'll, they're not paralyzed. They will be breathing probably while they're closing. So by the time, and we've turned things down, and we've watched the EEG change to be, be go up towards what the sed line we use towards 50. And then when we roll them over within a very short period of time, they're following commands and we're out of there. We use, we cut the, we significantly cut the Sufenta, so we don't run 0.6 to the end of the case. They may be on 0.05 for the last closing. And they flip them over, they're breathing their, they go out of there, they go to the recovery room. So, um, the we, are, we are at an academic institution as well. We have plenty of residents and we don't wake up in five minutes for all our cases, but. What, the we ones that we've browbeaten into tra and trained. <laughs> We have uh, our hour-long wake-ups. Yes, we do. We absolutely do. And we'll have people who have neurologic issues that we don't know about. So I had someone with, with schizophrenia, and that meant that we had a big problem. Um, so, you know, it all depends. And so what here, this is just the surgical issues. And the biggest issue that I want to talk about here, and we're going to have to blow through this too, is that we want... They have to talk to us about what they're seeing. And when we lose something, they have to tell us, do they have a dural tear? What's going on? What, what could be the problem? Is the screw in the wrong place? Um, if we're doing cranies, they're having, we're having seizure activity. Hey, guys, what's happening up there? So the biggest thing that a surgeon can do is look and then talk. And then we can reevaluate, reassess, and help. So, um, and that's there. OK, and then this one is, um, I think I'm going the wrong way, guys. I apologize. I'm trying to hurry there too much. Go. There we go. This is our case. So this is one of the simplest cases that we ever do. Truly simple. So this is a 64-year-old person. She's wonderfully healthy. She has a little pain in her right leg and some weakness, she says. No medical problems. She's got perfect blood pressure on no medications. We're going, where did we find her? She has a BMI of 25, um, and she only takes gabapentin because she doesn't like narcotics. So what should everyone not do? And this is probably the critical reason that we are successful at our program, is this is the anesthesia tech, and it's the only person in the room that's more likely to be the reason that bad things are happening than the anesthesia person. So this is our surgeon, the cat. And the cat says, wants, doesn't, does not go and says it's, it's the tech's problem. She's re she or he is reporting it test. The anesthesiologist does not say, I'm doing everything fine. No, the volatile's just OK. Again, they're reporting a test. The management is in your ballpark and in the surgeon's ballpark. They're reporting a test. So what should we all do? First of all, usually we go first for perfusion, and the second is we hunt for an answer of why this thing is going south. The next thing is the surgeon better start looking around, because if they believe us, then something's wrong. Do they need to image, take another scan? Do they, need, do they see clear fluid welling out of the incision? And then the tech, they keep checking, because maybe one of those things will work and get us to the end of this case. So we have this patient. There was no anesthesia issues. Everything looked perfect. The monitoring was accurate. They repeated it and repeated it and got the same problem. There was a surgical issue, and the surgeon said, well, the screw's not exactly perfect, but I would never have taken it out if you hadn't complained. So what did it look like? So it looked like Push. the IOM uh, tech gave uh, the anesthesia provider a call and said that our baseline response in green had now become this purple response right here, and the right tibial, uh, posterior tibial nerve response had basically become a flat line, which uh, what we consider a warning criteria or an alert criteria is greater than 50% degradation in amplitude or greater than 10% increase in latency. As you can see that this, this response was certainly much more than 50% change in, in, that, uh, in that response. So we gave a call and the anesthesia provider came to the room. 
And you can see the other side's just fine. Yeah, so that's a, that's a good uh, point. The, the, so the left tibial response unchanged, the upper extremity response unchanged, because you typically have a global change in signals when it's anesthetic or physiologic, but if it's, uh, it's a surgical change or positional surgical, um, then, you, then it's unilateral and more focal in nature. So he took the screw out, and this is what happened. Let me set that up. If we can't do it, we can say it because it. Yeah. So, so the, the screw came out. The the uh, the tech continued running responses, and the the amplitude improved. So the signal got back to within baseline values, and so the surgeon thought everything's good. I'll put the screw back in. Screw went back in. Continued to run uh, SSCPs. The the signal again degraded to greater than 50% change in response. Removed the screw again, and the signal came back again to within baseline values. And then the surgeon decided to replace this, the location he was doing the screws. So the entire, he did, redid the procedure on that side, doing it, going up a level on that side. Because no, he went back and forth about four times. And every time the screw went in, there was something about where it had broken through that he had a problem. And so this is a young surgeon, new into, new into our department, who trusted us and believed in us and said, something's wrong, I gotta change what I'm doing. And when he did, we didn't have a problem. So what happened? So we discharged her, he did his change, we discharged her. She, she said by the time she was leaving, she didn't, the pain was a lot better. Six weeks when she came back, she was doing all the activities he would allow. And at six months, she, when she came back for that final visit, she considered herself cured, which is quite remarkable in spine. Um, and we all had a celebration. And, and we had a celebration because it showed that being the team that responded to a test value could change the outcome in somebody because she was likely going to be someone who would come back with chronic pain and have to be redone again. So we have a few minutes left, very few minutes, if I can get this thing to actually do something. No. Anyway, what do you want to discuss? How do you well, um, well, I can tell you how I dose, and you can tell, tell them. I, my dosing is I, um, I give a really low dose and I only infuse because most of the trouble problems that have happened with ketamine and people suggesting that maybe boluses of ketamine can actually depress um, the responses, I just do an infusion. So I, and I don't have anything magic. Uh, a frail little old lady who doesn't take much drugs gets five milligrams an hour, a robust dude who's taking God only knows how much and a lot of marijuana in Colorado too, um, I'll give him 15 to 25 depending on what I've got going and it's just an infusion. I go, went till they start to close and I turn it off. They generally do really well. They don't, we don't have a lot of problem when we do that with pain. Yeah, I just typically do an infusion at 10 milligrams an hour and stop it if it gets to greater than one milligram per kilogram total uh, dose for the patient during the procedure. A lot of times our cases go for greater than 10 hours, so it can frequently get to over one milligram per kilo if we don't dis discontinue the infusion. And why I've decided, my computer's decided not to run, I don't know. But um, this, the, this is, in this point, we would like to spend the last few minutes talking about anything that anyone wants to talk about. If you want to present a case, if you want to just ask questions that the whole audience can respond to, that would be great. Or if you want to get out and enjoy Montreal, home. yes. Do you have a total loss of signal that you used to like, in this kind of problem? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we will often do that. If we think that it's surgically related, are you saying? Like a unilateral focal total loss? Or stretch injury, ischemia. Mm-hmm. We do. Yeah, that's still very common. Yes, sir. Uh, are you using methadone, and if so, are you having any trouble with wake-up tests? Um, we don't ever do wake-up tests, so I can't answer that. Um, you've been in children's um, more recently than I have, and so do they use methadone over there? Uh, it's, it's rare that, that we use methadone. We were using a, a, a single-time dose of IV methadone uh, about one year ago when we were having a shortage of... Um, 
I don't remember exactly. Uh, yeah, we had fentanyl shortage even at uh, at the university, and we were giving a single dose. But no, we do do preoperative uh, Tylenol, uh, Lyrica, or Gabapentin, and then uh, a single dose of uh, uh, 15 milligrams of Mobic. So we give that preoperatively. But we, I very rarely have used the methadone. And, the and that's a, it's a controversial drug as well. There's some evidence that shows that it does interfere with uh, um, intraoperative monitoring, but then some equally valid evidence that shows no no real effect. The way I use it is if you're on it, you stay on it. So I make sure you take it, but I don't start it because my worry is I've, I've had, while well, in my career at this hospital, I've had someone die from someone not understanding how methadone works and that it accumulates. It's not worth it to me. If you're not on it, I don't give it. But that's a personal anxiety. Other, in, in yes, sir. Mm. One, one of the advantages, and going to your question, is if you use opioid-based anesthesia techniques, then you can theoretically reverse the effect by giving naloxone if you have problems and you want to do a wake-up test. That's an option that is available to you. I've never had to do that with, when I have given methadone, but theoretically it might work if you had to wake somebody up. Has anybody else used methadone and done wake-up tests? How many people do wake-up tests? Wake So it's not actually during the case, it's at the end. So I, when I, 20 years ago when I left Wisconsin, the surgeons I've been working with, none of them have asked for a wake-up test, so I really, you know that much better. Anyone who does it knows it much better than I do. Any other questions? And shout really loud, because we've got some wonderful people over here on the side. And, or you could be some, Get up and use the mic. Do we use preoperative EPO? Um, occasionally, but not systematically. We, in, gen in general, just transfuse, and we do use cell saver. If the patient's been seen by a preoperative clinic in a sufficient time, prior to surgery, then the preoperative clinic does uh, order that, but um, it's, it's, it is rare, yeah. Other thoughts? Thank you for engaging in our experiment and asking poor Colby to be two people. So um, I, it caused a significant degradation in what we could do and that you sat through it and listened. Thank you. Thank you.